All right, so going over the exam today, first off, <clears throat> everybody did pretty well. All the results are in on Sapphire. Uh, results for the experiment project presentations are in as well. So good to go. All right, so the new it all along effect after an event has occurred, seeing the event as being predictable despite having been little or no objective basis of predicting it. We know that as hindsight bias, okay? <clears throat> An experiment where both the subject and the person administering the experiment do not know the nature of the independent variable being administered. That's a double blind study. Research in which we choose subjects based on pre existing conditions, ex post facto, right? Uh, that, that group that has not, or yeah, the group that is not exposed to the treatment control group. It's where we base our observations off of that group, right? The group in the experiment that is exposed to the treatment, that is experimental group. A sample obtained in such a way that is reflects the distribution of important variables in the larger population. That's a representative sample. Right? I give an example of that a lot with just using people in this room, the students in this room, compared to the... Uh, Obviously, the whole school, right? high school students here at UDA. The measured outcome of a study or the response of the subjects in the study is the dependent variable. Right? That is the effect, right? So that is the measured outcome. A stimulus condition that the experimenter changes independently of all other carefully controlled conditions in the experiment, that's the independent variable. Right? That is the cause. So something the experimenter changes to try to see the results, the dependent variable. One group or subject is studied for an extended period of time to observe changes in the long term. That's a longitudinal study, right? So we know that as being a long intensive study, time expensive, but you're gathering the results, the observations. Thanks, Sarah. You're good. Yeah. Thanks. Of, um, you know, of one subject or one group for a long period. So, uh, the benefits to it we know as being you're gathering an information from one group, one subject. Okay, but expenses to it, disadvantages is the time expense. Maybe financially too. Joe Exotic, financially won't recover from that. One group or subject is studied for an extended oh I got that one. Is an explanation based on integrated principles that organizes observations and predicts behaviors or events. We know that as a hypothesis. Okay, that's the vocab. Sarah, I'm using your exam. You told me the other day I could use it, so there we go. All right, so multiple choice. What is one method researchers use to conduct surveys? Phone interviews. Okay, phone interviews. All right, experiments, that won't be it. Laboratory observations, that's not it. If you want to gather data, gather information from a group of people, represent a sample or a person, subject, whatever, phone interviews would be a good way to conduct surveys. All right. We gave our survey, you know, with Google Forms. If you wanted to, you could just email it to the whole student body. That'd be cool, right? Yeah, everybody takes that survey and you can gather that data pretty quick, pretty fast, and even charts it for you, which is really nice. Okay, so you don't have to do it by hand. If you wanted to, you could. Just really time expensive. Google Forms is a good way to gather information pretty quick. All right. In order to confirm the results of the experiments, researchers need to do this first, to replicate it. We all know that you can't draw a conclusion or summarize your data until you replicate your study to make sure that all variables are accounted for, okay, and there's no confounding variables that might skew your data. What is an example of a naturalistic observation? Observing a wild turkey walking in the woods, white hunting. Oh. that yeah so definitely not a baby snapper turtle and in my aquarium tank I used to have a pet snapper turtle not anymore I let him loose let him out in the wild okay because it's obviously not his natural habitat observing a lion in the zoo exhibit same thing not his natural setting why are psychologists afraid to generalize based off of case studies because each case can be vastly different in its circumstances. It could be subjects, it could be uh, you know, groups obviously, it could be the environment, 
it could be a cultural aspect, social aspect. Uh, yeah, it could be a many of different variables that could uh, cause a different result depending on how you're looking or studying something, making observations. Which of the following best describes cross-sectional method? Researchers compare differences and similarities among people of different age groups at a given time. So we know longitudinal studies, time expensive. It takes a long period of time to gather that information. Okay, but with a cross-sectional, we can gather that data pretty quick by just observing different subjects, different groups of people at a given time, and it eliminates that time expense, but you're probably not gathering that, uh, you know, that, that information of, let's say, development of someone over time. But correlation is a measure of how closely one variable is related to another. <clears throat> we know that, the relationship between two variables. A placebo is a treatment that has no effect apart from a person's belief in the effect. Right? So this is something that is like a sugar pill, something that is not actually helping or treating an, I don't know, a, a problem someone might have. Okay. So usually the control group, let's say if it's like a double blind study, uh, the control group maybe would receive this placebo or a single blind study to make sure that people uh, see the observable differences between the experimental group and control group. Confidentiality in experiments is important to keep record private about research, right? We just can't give that information out about, you know, people and, you know, their results or, you know, their, 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 their reactions to certain things. It's not ethical, right? Go ahead, Sarah. So I was kind of thinking about that too, like how placebo is kind of like deceiving somebody when you're yeah. like trying to do that. Just like the, the like psychology association, they don't consider that like deception. Do they? Like that follows ethical standards still, do you think? Cause like, That's true. Like, I kind of thought about that. It is kind of deceiving them, but not in like a malicious way. I don't yeah, I don't think so. I think they're just seeing if they might have a psychological impact on someone if they think they are receiving a treatment but yeah i, I guess I, I see what you're saying uh, i know with the video with emily rose we watched at the end you know with the placebo and everybody's like oh, yeah it's a lot better it's like you know what if they watch that video or if it's presented to everybody like we know if their names are given it's like look how foolish you look right look how embarrassing that is i mean yeah i guess i guess you could say that is kind of unethical building on people's intuition and uh yeah imagination i don't know yeah so i guess it would be kind of unethical i don't know if it like you said it's not malicious or anything but yeah i didn't necessarily think it was unethical but i kind of called it politics i mean i know i wouldn't be happy about it yeah it's like oh yeah just not you know show that but maybe they actually signed a consent form to say hey yeah you can you can you know express that our reactions to realizing that it was just a placebo pill and maybe that's how I got away with it so yeah all right in a longitudinal uh, method researchers study participants over extended period of time we know that all right so select what graph represents a positive correlation option one you know rising in the right corner and the variables seem to represent themselves pretty well the correlation seems pretty strong here with height and weight right not all the times right not all the time you know some people are tall and just really skinny right? in our cases we know some people are bigger and taller right? not giving any names out here i was going to say branson branson's a big guy right he's a big tall guy so and then uh holden steely he's really tall but he's he's like a twig he's skinny you know Something like that. but here i am giving names right here i am giving names. what's that Georgie, yeah. Georgie's real tall. Cooper, too. Jordan Cooper, he's really tall. John Reed tall. Who? John. John. Reed. I don't know if I know him. John Reed? I don't know. All right, so the graph represents a negative correlation. So representing data on a negative slope. Okay, this correlation really doesn't seem too tight. Okay, there might be a... I guess say negative correlation in a way, almost to a, like a no correlation, but 
that data seems like it's going in the, you know, this downward slope. And then no correlation. Okay, we know the data points are scattered all around. Okay, there is no positive relationship or negative relationship there. All right, so what is a dependent variable in the statement? Students watch a cartoon, either alone or with others, and then rated how funny they found the cartoon to be. So dependent variable is members that measured outcome, how funny the students rated the cartoon. So that's the measurement. <clears throat> what is an independent variable in the statement? A comprehension test was given to a students who have, you know, students after they had studied textbook material either in silence or the television turned on. So studying textbook material in silence or with the television on. So it depends if it's silent or if they had noise in the background. All right, so what is the dependent variable in the statement? Some elementary school teachers were told a child's parents were college graduates and other teachers were told that the child's parents had no or had not finished high school. Uh, they then rated the child's grades. So dependent variables that measured outcome, the child's grades. All right, so short answer. What is a single blind study? What is a double blind study? What is the difference between the two versions of the experiments? So Sarah, Knocked it out of the park here. Single blind studies when the volunteer does not know what the independent or dependent uh, two variable of the experiment are. A double blind study is when the experimenter and the volunteer do not know what the independent variables are. So the difference is a single blind study is used to prevent volunteer bias based off of knowledge of expectation from occurring. When a double blind study is just to see what uh, would happen to under certain, certain, uh, certain conditions. So we know double blind study, researcher, uh, the volunteers in the study, they don't know who is receiving the experimental control and who is the control group. A single blind study, that experimenter knows, but the volunteers in the study do not. Describe what a longitudinal study is and give an example of how this study would compare to a cross-sectional study. Longitudinal study, expanded over a long period of time, You're studying a group, group of people, subjects, okay, over that long period of time. Uh, those individuals, though, okay, there's no different groups or subjects studied. Uh, it's very time expensive, cross-sectional study. You're studying different groups, different subjects over a short period of time, over a given period of time. And uh, we all know that the data could be different depending on who you're studying, okay, the differences of um, observations, how they might react to certain stimulus, whatever it might be. Uh, but it eliminates that time expense. So describe why ethics and research is important. Detail how the experiment you currently researching may have crossed ethical guidelines. Explain why it is important for people to learn and study these experiments. So yeah, with your experiment, okay, it might not have crossed ethical guidelines, right? But how might it have? What, what did you respond with, Sarah? I said, like, this is really important about experimenting. Like, I said, like, I need to go without studying and over a long period of time, like it's, it's basically just like a test crowd at that point. Yeah. It has to go into a lab every so often, get like CAT scan or whatever, look at their brain, like how they're affected or whatever. That's just what I was kind of not making something up, but I was thinking if that were like an actual situation, like, yeah, you would do something like that, like how would it affect somebody who's trying to like live their life? Yeah, it's like, hey. Uh, in a couple months you're out, let's go. We're seeing your development in your brain and your cerebral cortex, so jump right back in that tube there, and we need to scan you. So, yeah, I mean, maybe that would cross some ethical guidelines, but I'm sure the kid, the person, agreed to it, so they're just like, yeah. At that point, I guess it would be the, the, the child's parents, if you're going to go through development. Maybe the, ch the kid was like, I hate this. I, hate yeah, that, that would, I feel like that would actually be yeah. Mm -hmm. the parents are like, we're getting some money from this. You're going in that tube. Lay down and we're throwing you in there. You can't move either. Those MRIs are tough. Oh, anybody ever get an MRI in here? Oh, man. It's like you can't move at all. And I'm one of that. I can't sit still. So I'm always like, ah. Oh. Nonsense. But yeah, ethics. Okay. So ethics and research. We know are very important to make sure that people aren't harmed in the studies and in the experiments. And uh, these kind of came about at the end of World War II. Right? Unfortunately, with these experiments that were done, although they did find a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, scientific, I guess you say, guidelines and principles and 
just ways, like I said, uh, the studies of these people in harsh conditions, um, it's very unethical to put these people in harm's way and uh, to make sure that we can protect these people uh, that are being studied. Okay, and that's especially why ethics are very important. And it depends what study you had, you know, how you can relate it to ethics and research and, you know, maybe how it cross guidelines. Okay. Probably won't watch it in here. Usually I watch the Stanford Prison Experiment in here with, the, you know, Netflix. It's on Netflix, so if you have Netflix, check it out. It's a pretty good study. It's a pretty good uh, document documentary uh, on that. And uh, there's a lot of cursing in it, though, so I want to make sure you guys know about it before you just jump right into it or you're watching it in front of your siblings or your parents. There's a lot of uh, curse words in it. There's a lot of uncomfortable situations, too. So I just want to warn you before you watch it. We won't watch it in here no, just because I want to continue moving on with, you know, the class. All right. So that's the exam. What's that? No. <laughs> well, I'm not too worried about it. As long as you, you know, have the, the content down, I'm good. All right. So moving on here, bell ringer. I know what you're thinking, bell ringer. We didn't go over anything yet, but since we talked about this perspective in chapter one, I think it's important maybe to just bring it up and how we can represent it here of what we're going to be studying in this next chapter. So in your own words, describe the impact biology has on psychology and vice versa. There we go. So your study, Sarah, this is right up your alley. Yeah, right up your alley. So I'll give you some time to work on this. It'll take you a little bit longer. How about I give you like three minutes? So I'll give you another minute or two to finish up. Anybody watch Shaq last night on AEW? Shaquille O'Neal, no? He got put through a table. Oh, no. I'm guessing there's no wrestling fans in here. Shaquille <laughs> O'Neal was like, the basketball player? Yeah, he does like the fake wrestling stuff. Yeah, he loves it. Um, yeah. He, what, WWE? Well, he he was on WWE, but now he's, he joined AEW, which is like the competitor to WWE now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
All right. So in, in your own words, describe the impact biology has on psychology and vice versa. Hannah, what do you have? Um, I have that the biology part is relevant to psychology studies how like our, our nervous system and our like our hormones work. Yeah. And it also tells us how the how our brain functions and how it changes in structure over time. Yeah, good job. Good job. So especially with the developmental view, um, we, we can see how we develop over time and understand and grasp different theories, concepts and understanding of the world and how we react to certain stimulus. We can just study the brain and see where that's located and Maybe if there is information that we can gather from that. All right, good. Good job. Right. And uh, there's many other perspectives, like I mentioned, with biology that kind of play into psychology. Uh, again, just definitely with reactions and, and uh, how we react to certain things and development, uh, you know, how we develop. And, and definitely with maybe hormonal imbalances, okay, why we act certain ways depending on imbalances in our body. Okay, maybe we can't prevent it. Maybe we can't help it. Good. Michaela, what do you have? Yeah, good work. Good job. Yeah, so they kind of go hand in hand, uh, especially when we're applying some of these theories together and these perspectives and approaches and um, biology in some cases, like with the, the study that Sarah Sarah did yesterday and studied it was really just kind of proving the fact of these uh, these theories and these perspectives that were brought out you know maybe way before and studying the brain more okay maybe we could prove these theories and it's more just applying the sciences to it and then and, uh, maybe putting these theories to the test good Sarah what do you have I said that like biology can verify psychological perspectives and theories by studying like scientific makeup of the brain and seeing how things work and what they do. And then um, psychology can like influence biological study of the brain. So I think that's probably like neurology is a fairly new field. So that's probably why it came into light is because like, you know, now we're asking questions about why we think the way we do and then people are trying to form like a scientific backing to explain basically. Awesome. Yeah, good job. Good job. And uh, it kind of hints back to when we talk about the approaches and perspectives to psych and, you know, the pseudo or the phrenology, right? The phrenology and how we study the mind and how that came about. It's like, you know what, maybe we should study the mind. Maybe we should look into it. And especially nowadays with neuroscience and being able to look into the brain and understand a little bit more in detail uh, with the new forms of technology that allows us to do this, we can definitely really apply these methods and really understand why people do the things they do by studying the brain in more detail and see how it, you know, how it, how it, how it acts and reacts in certain stimuluses and certain, I guess you could say, experiences. Good. Good job. All right. Yeah. So they definitely play hand in hand. All right. How about I give you some time to work on the vocab? What about like three, four minutes? Okay. I just posted those terms. It's on the stream. Okay. You can find that on the stream there. We'll get into some of the lesson today. So right here on the stream. Okay. New episode of WandaVision comes out tomorrow. Anyone watching that? What? WandaVision. It's on Disney Plus. 
Oh my gosh, are you serious? Too cool for it, huh? Too cool for school. <laughs> That's funny. Now I'm excited. Last episode, and the season's over. Actually, I think the whole show's over. They're only doing one season. Outer Banks. What's that all about? Surfing? Yeah. Hunting for crabs? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Were you ever at the Outer Banks? No. Oh, that's pretty cool. They actually used to. It's interesting there. Well, the Outer Banks with the flight, okay, the Wright brothers. So there's some history there. And to prepare for island hopping and invasions of islands during World War II, they actually went to the Outer Banks and were preparing to these invasions like on, on the Outer Banks, on the islands there. It's pretty neat. Pretty cool stuff. So there is a lot of history there on the Outer Banks. Did they mention that in the show? The Wright brothers, I'm sure. The flight. Yeah, first flight. All right. How about one more minute here? All right, so obviously we know this chapter is about biopsychology, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, chromosomes, genes, uh, DNA a little bit. We'll get into more about the brain, uh, the neuron, okay? I thought it was interesting, Sarah, your, your experiment kind of just goes hand in hand with this. It just goes right into it, and we will study the brain. Uh, I, I know you studied it there with the drug project, right? I think. With uh, this like brim. Oh, I got you. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to take an in-depth look at the brain and its basic functions and its parts and the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, and the brain stem. All right. So psychology and biology, they all work hand in hand. They work together. Okay. They work together. So it is definitely important to study the brain and its systems, the nervous system, okay, the endocrine system, okay, and we'll talk about the skeletal system as well and how this all comes together and how all of this plays a, a factor in how we respond to certain things and how we experience the world around us, okay, how we form memories, how we have feelings, okay, how we have motor movements, okay, how we perform all these different tasks. And it all plays in hand in hand with biology. Okay, it all, all comes together, and we can't forget about social experience as, as well. So, sociology, okay, will definitely play some roles in this as well. Right? How our experience with different cultures, okay, how we uh, have different types of nature versus nurture. Right, that's always the battle with psychology. Are we, burnt, are we born with these instinctive behaviors, or do we learn over time these new concepts of how to react and uh, experience the world? Certain cases, I do think we concepts and understanding of how to survive in our own in our own environment. All right, so one of the biggest things is the brain. Okay, we're going to be studying the brain here a lot. And these are just some facts about the brain, okay? Obviously, we're going to go in more detail, like I mentioned, with the cerebral cortex, okay, the limbic system, the brain stem. Um, but I think it's important to just kind of talk about the brain a little bit more. So it's about three pounds, about the size of a grapefruit, pinkish gray in color, about 100 billion nerve cells. Ooh, so neurons constantly firing. And neurons, we're going to talk about more in this chapter, how that's important with learning and understanding new concepts, how we build neural connections when we learn new tasks. Okay, it's, it's kind of crazy, but just learning to walk, learning to grab things, talk when we're babies, and how these neural connections just form then. And now, you know, as young adults, we can perform these awesome tasks with 
athleticism and and uh, maybe just understanding these concepts pretty quick and fast and how some of these just come like second nature. Last semester I had TC, Mikhail in here, and throwing a ball. It's like, how long did it take you to throw a ball? Not long. He's grabbed and tossed it. He's pretty athletic. He can make those neural connections pretty quick. And obviously the more we practice something, the more we look over it and understand, we build a firmer neural connection. It's like almost creating roads and bridges in our brain. The more we practice it, obviously the roads are going to become more and more as it's being traveled. Right? It's going to be a larger road. And you're going to have to create a larger highway in, in sort of case for the traffic coming through, if that makes sense. At a loss rate of 200,000 per day during our adult lives, we end up still over 90%, 98% of our brain cells. So we lose brain cells by doing different things. I'm not going to mention some of them, but yeah. So impacts especially, right? Impacts with football. Uh, that's one of the main studies of, you know, different types of technology for helmets, okay? And CTE and uh, how that might affect the brain, you know, especially with its development over time. And you know, maybe there, there, there is some studies that maybe some children should focus more on you know, on flag football rather than high impacts. But we all know concussions and impacts to the brain don't always have to be in collisions and hitting and tackling. It doesn't help it for sure, but even in soccer, right, even if you're running, okay, if you just kind of move in one direction, you could get a concussion just like that. It just really depends how you, who you are and, you know, how you maybe move in certain, certain cases. And it does happen. Strange, but it does happen. All right, so biopsychology, speciality in psychology, it studies the interaction of biology, behavior, and mental processes. Neuroscience, All right? You talk about this a lot, Sarah. So a newer field of study in psychology focuses on the brain and our behavior. <clears throat> so studying the brain, studying the lobes, it's very important to see exactly where memories are stored, where we can relate information to past experiences where we understand and functions of you know, society, you know, societal norms and morals, okay, movements, sensations, uh, where we focus on rational thinking, critical thinking, our sight, which is interesting, and our occipital lobe is located in the back of our brain. How that makes sense, I don't know. So uh, when we're visualizing something, we'll talk about next chapter with, with sensation and perception. It's actually projected on the back of our brain upside down. And our brain understands this and flips the image right side up. It's interesting how it works. But our brain's amazing and what, can, what it can do. Many people say, oh, we just, you know, we haven't tapped into the brain's full potential. What are you talking about? Are we going to do telekinesis or are we going to... Uh, Maybe control things with our mind, like Dr. Xavier, Dr. X, right, from uh, X-Men. You guys know X-Men? No? Oh, my gosh. I feel like a nerd up here. Ooh, WandaVision, X-Men, right? Yeah. Professor oh, X. What's that? Oh, yeah, Matilda. Yeah. That is a cool movie. Trunchful, right? This is Trunchful. My one teacher in elementary school is funny. Uh I always thought she was real mean. Like she was like a bigger figure too. It was like she was just like oh, like demanding and mean to us. And I was just viewed her as like trunchable. And it's funny now. One of my best friends I work with in the summer is he's married to her. So I got to know her a little bit more. And like I always thought you're just this mean lady. I'm so sorry. It's just like oh yeah yeah. She jokes around with it. It's hilarious. And I watched that movie in her class, which was funny. She goes oh I know what you guys are thinking. <laughs> which is hilarious. Danny DeVito is good in that movie, too. He's great. I love DeVito. All right, so innate abilities. All right, so innate abilities. Uh, this is interesting. We're going to talk about evolutionary psychology here soon. I know we mentioned in Chapter 1 with per uh, perspectives and approaches. And uh, one thing is how we adapt, okay, how we evolve over time to try to help us in our environment, okay, and I think this is a pretty cool story. So this used to be a picture for the Philadelphia Phillies. And uh, this guy actually had an extra finger, right? So it's, it's 
it's kind of funny how how this was used. He's like, oh yeah, I can have a different spin on the ball, control the ball, especially with major league baseball and pitching. Uh, one thing is how you can control the ball and different types of pitches and velocity and speeds that you can put on it to try to uh, really make a make it hard for someone to bat off here, hit the ball, right? So I thought this was pretty neat. Polydactyl disorder. So this happens every now and then. It's not common, really. It's like a rare genetic, uh, I guess you could, no one's called it a disorder, but a genetic feat, I guess. Uh, mutation. Yeah, mutation. Yeah, since we're talking about the X-Men mutants, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, mutation over time. And uh, some people say, oh, this is a form of evolution. And it's like, oh, I don't know about that. Maybe it's just, it is what it is. Like you said, a mutation. Right? It, it, I won't call it an evolutionary like, he wasn't born to be a pitcher. Yeah, he's really good at it. And maybe this extra finger helped him out a little bit. But my brother's cat, he has – he has a, my, his cat, he has a extra, I guess you'd say, finger on his – on his. I guess it would be a toe on his foot. Yeah. So his hand, his claws, his paws are, like, huge. It's a big cat. And I think it helps him definitely when he's fighting my other brother's cat. He's just like, boom, smokes him in the head and just goes, here I am, talk about mistreatment of cats. You guys are going to put me in jail for this, the way I throw I, my I cat around. Like, I almost didn't want to hear. I was just taking my notes, and, like, the sound of the cat hitting the door. I don't know if it, like, knocked into something, but, like, I instantly just kind of laughed. <laughs> I was, like, just comedic relief. Like, yeah. I did not expecting that, but it was hilarious. Oh, well, I tell you what. He got me good on the hand yesterday. You can see my hand. It's cut. He, he's such a jerk. And on oh, my tricep, too. I don't know if you can see that cut here. That's yeah, a pretty that's long. long. Yeah. I was uh, I was uh, working on just cleaning out my uh, coal stove, and he's standing over on the table, and I walk by him. I don't know what happened. Like, I just walked by, and he just just cut my arm right down. It was pretty long. And it was pretty – like, my, my skin was dry. I just got a shower, and it was, like, dry air down in my basement with the coal stove going. And it was so sensitive. I just like, why? What? What was that for? Yeah, yeah. He just likes playing, I guess. But he's he's kind of a jerk. He's getting his fingernails cut today, though. He's gonna hate that. <clears throat> All right. So, like I mentioned before, the wrong-headed theory. I don't. You don't have to write notes on this. We went over it already. But it's important to know with phrenology, even though this is a crazy thing, right? Even though that. You know, with uh, this idea of feeling bumps on people's heads was practice in the 1800s, and they thought that this was a way to explain behaviors and how people reacted. Um, this was obviously interesting, okay? And we all know that that's not real. It's a pseudoscience. But at the same time, this pushed more people to think, you know what? Maybe the brain has more of more of a, a, a play in the way we react and the way we perform different tasks and the way we think and uh, understand new concepts. And it really kind of builds on this nature versus nurture, which we're going to talk about more tomorrow since we're running low on time of evolutionary psychology. So yeah, phrenology, even though it was crazy, people were just, you know, it was just outlandish. Um, and it did have a play in how we understand the brain and maybe more people focused on it because of this. All right, is there any questions on that? You guys good? So I wanted to get more into this a little bit, but uh, how about tomorrow I talk about evolutionary psychology. You'll have a reading about traits and just an assignment about, you know, if you had the ability to make a child to genetically make a, a, a I guess you could say more athletic or if you can make them tall or strong or whatever it might be, you have the ability to do that. And there's an article about how we can maybe maybe genetically manipulate our offspring. And I think it's interesting. So I'll let you guys read that tomorrow. That's all I got for today.